Professor Phil Gaines from the MSU English Department. We'll be reading one clue from one clue or two clues in this. Just a couple of editorial comments. I tried to read novels on my iPad for a certain period of time and I couldn't do it, so I'm back to books. <laughs> um, and second, um, consider the number of countries in the world where such a gathering would be impossible. This is not, maybe not a uniquely American thing, but it's certainly distinctly so. Um, I chose one, um, one flew over the cuckoo's nest in the past few years because of this book's position in the political literary history of the United States, written in 1962. It was one of the early um, novels to uh, present an anti-institutional, anti-establishment, anti-authoritarian uh, posture. Uh, it chose a, um, uh, a mental health institute hospital and it's the story of a number of certainly troubled characters, but not all of whom are insane, um, and the struggles they have. The protagonist is uh, Randall McMurphy, um, a, a, a shyster and a, and a performer, but at the same time a, a man of some principle. The uh, narrator is Chief Bromden, um, a Native American inmate of the institution as well, and I'm going to read uh, the final passage from the book uh, at the very end of the book. And uh, just a couple of notes for reference if you haven't read it. Um, McMurphy has just been wheeled into the, uh, the living area having received a lobotomy because he had attacked Nurse Ratchet. So he was essentially lost to the world. And uh, Chief Brogdon, Brogdon had had enough uh, and was, had decided to get out of the place. Uh, but before that, he had decided also to smother to death McMurphy because he couldn't tolerate the idea of him living his life in that condition. Um, so, th three, three things. The control panel is a, is a large uh, device that manages the electricity and the water in the tub area of the, of the living area. Uh, she is Nurse Ratchet, and Scanlon is another inmate who was a, a, a close bedmate to I lay for a while, holding the covers over my face, and thought I was being pretty quiet. But Scanlon's voice, hissing from the bed, let me know I wasn't. Take it easy, Chief, he said. Take it easy. It's okay. Shut up, I whispered. Go ahead, It was quiet a while. Then I heard him hiss again and ask, Is it finished? I told him, yeah. Christ, he said then, she'll know. You realize that, don't you? Sure, nobody will be able to prove anything. Anybody could have kicked off in post-operative, but like he was, happens all the time, but she, she'll know. I didn't say anything. Was that you, Chief? I breezed my tail out of here. Yes, sir, I tell you what, you leave out of here, and I'll say I saw him up and moving around after you left and cover you that way. That's the best idea, don't you think? Oh yeah, just like that. Just ask him to unlock the door and let me out. No, he showed you how one time. If you think back, that very first week, remember? I didn't answer him and he didn't say anything else and it was quiet in the dorm again. I lay there a few minutes longer and then got up and started putting on my clothes. When I finished dressing, I reached into McMurphy's nightstand and got his cap and tried it on. It was too small, and I was suddenly ashamed of trying to wear it. I dropped it on Scanlon's bed as I walked out of the door. He said, take it easy, buddy. I walked out. The moon straining through the screen of the tub room windows showed the hunched, heavy shape of the control panel, glinted off the chrome fixtures and glass gauges so cold I could almost hear them click with the striking. I took a deep breath bent over and took the levers. I heaved my legs under me and felt the grind of weight at my feet. I heaved again and heard the wires and connections tearing out of the floor. I lurched it up to my knees and was able to get an arm around it and my other hand under it. The chrome was cold against my neck and the side of my head. 
put my back toward the screen, then spun and let the momentum carry the panel through the screen and window with a ripping crash. The glass splashed out in the moon like a bright, cold water baptizing the sleeping earth. Panting. I thought for a second about going back and getting Scanlon and some of the others, but then I heard the running squeak of the black boy's shoes in the hall, and I put my hand on the sill and vaulted after the panel into the moonlight. I ran across the grounds in the direction I remembered seeing the dog go toward the highway. I remember taking huge strides as I ran, something seeming to step and float a long ways before my next foot struck the earth. I felt like I was flying free. Nobody bothers coming after an AWOL, I knew. Scanlon can handle any questions about the dead man. No need to be running like this. But I didn't stop. I ran for miles before I stopped and walked up the embankment onto the highway. I caught a ride with a guy, a Mexican guy, going north in a truck full of sheep and gave him such a good story about me being a professional Indian wrestler. The syndicate had tried to lock up in a nut house that he stopped real quick and gave me a leather jacket to cover my greens loan me ten bucks to eat on while I hitchhiked to Canada. I had him write his address down before he drove off, and I told him I'd send him the money as soon as I got a little ahead. I might go to Canada eventually, but I think I'll stop along the Columbia on the way. I'd like to check around Port Hood River and the Dalles to see if there's any of the guys I used to know back in the village who hadn't drunk themselves goofy I'd like to see what they've been doing since the government tried to buy their right to be Indians. I even heard that some of the tribe took their building, took to building their old ramshackle wood scaffolding all over that big million dollar hydroelectric dam and are spearing salmon in the spillway. I'd give something to see that. Mostly I'd just like to look over the country again about the gorge, just to bring some of it clear in my mind again. 